Welcome, everyone. The idea for this workshop began when we were doing a book study for the Quaker meeting of a book called Are We Done Fighting? And he was talking about having peace go viral. We're going through the book, and there's a lot of wonderful things in this book. You really, it, it, it deserves to be read by everyone. Um, and we got to the last couple chapters, last section of it, and he described a number of peace conflict situations. And a number of us in the group said, I thought I was with him on this, but we're not ready yet. We, we need some more learning. So we said, well, let's find some resources. Well, fortunately, there are some excellent resources right in our community. Uh, for the Norton Spirit Radio programs I do, I've interviewed Salika a couple times, and Jim Handley as well. Uh, and so I knew about some of these resources. So I talked to them uh, as Rod said to me, I think, this, when we saw, I saw him earlier today, he said, uh, well, this wild idea that I had, I, I just floated an idea to the first Salika and Jim, and they brought on Rod. Um, and I felt so excited that we had not only these kind of resources here, but these are people who are willing to put themselves out for the community. So I'm looking for each of them to introduce themselves so that we get to know one another. Uh, how someone gets to the point of feeling confident in working for peace, in intervening in situations of injustice without causing violence. Each of our three presenters has done those things in their life that get them to that point. Of course, there's so many ways that we can have violence and conflict in our lives. Uh, we all experience it within ourselves. Uh, anybody here ever been at odds with themselves? I know nobody's hands are raised. I guess it never happened. Okay. Yeah, it, it's so common. Uh, but in families, in community, and so on. And so uh, each of our presenters has worked at various layers of that, at, at, at all different layers of where we can have peace or violence. So I'm just really excited to have them there. We hope that you will actually have had hands-on experience so that by the end of this 10 hours of workshop, you'll feel a little bit better equipped to intercede on the part of justice, on part of compassion, and that you'll feel confident enough that you'll be helping the situation instead of hurting it. Many of us say, if I step in, will I be making it worse? And we'll have a better sense of that by the end of this time. So uh, on very local levels, in terms of race, or in terms of religion, or bigotry, so many different ways that we need to intervene to make this a better world, that we need, the world needs our energy. We're gonna have a better sense of that by the end of these 10 hours. And so Salika, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, she uh, has such a rich amount of experience that there's no question that uh, she's a mentor for many of us. So I'm honored for that introduction. My name is Salika Duxworth Lawton. I teach here at the university. I teach African-American history, civil rights history, and military history. I'll be teaching Vietnam War in the spring. As you imagine, a lot of people will be in there. Um, I'm also the president of Uniting Bridges. I'm on the state and local executive board for ACLU. I wear a lot of hats around here. And I'm here today to help with some very practical applications. So we're not just gonna talk about theoretical we are going to be role playing and working for practical applications you can use in the street, at a protest, with other people. For my background, I came here from Rand Corporation. We are not just a defense contractor. 
We provide research support to institutions, governments, et cetera, across the nation. So I spent three years traveling the world and looking for ways to keep the U.S. out of trouble. Needless to say, I was not successful. <laughs> I still do some contracting for them. I still do some contracting for U.S. Army Strategic Studies. And I'm the Reserve Officer Training Corps Military Historian for the um, U.S. Army Northwoods Battalion up here. So all of the ROTC cadets have to deal with me. But I'm also on Eau Claire Police and Fire Commission, which means I get to help to hire and fire police. And that means I have been blessed with the ability to help Eau Claire Police and now um, Altoona and Menominee move towards the reforms that, if you know about them, they're called the Eight Can't Wait reforms that are part of the ACLU Smart Justice. So what that means on the Eau Claire Police and Fire, we weigh in when there's misconduct. We um, help hire the chiefs. To be honest, we do hire the chiefs, whether they're for the police department or the fire department. I was on the panel that did hire Chief Rokas. Uh, but we also, while we don't set direct policy like use of force, we set policy at the philosophy level. Does that make sense? So adopting the eight can't wait, adopting the, trans, um, the transparency tab, when we're hiring, looking for people with a service mentality as opposed to a military attack mentality. Pushing the police department towards a more extended use of force so that that's not the first thing that they go to. So that's what police and fire does, as well as taking citizen complaints. Uh, so that means down on the ground, I have a very practical view. I also have people out in the community who will walk up to me, like one did at Pride, and say, why can't you just tell people to comply? Why can't you just tell your people to comply? So I need to be able to speak across race and to speak across class and mediate across these spaces to try to get what I need done. And I think that's one of the reasons why Mark wanted me here today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. I feel important now. <laughs> uh, my name is Jim Hanley, and uh, I, I, teach, uh, I teach peace studies at UW-Stout. Uh, I led the development of that program about seven years ago. And to be honest with you, people laughed at me. Uh, but it was hard to come out like strongly against a peace studies program. Uh, so so they, they let me do it and, it and it turned out that it filled a niche that people didn't know were there. Uh, it, it eventually became one of our largest academic minors uh, in our department uh, where we have hundreds of students every semester that are basically learning a lot of the things that, that we're going to be talking about uh, over the next day and a half. Um, I'm also a certified Kingian nonviolence trainer. Um, so I studied under Dr. Bernard Lafayette, who was a close confidant of Dr. King, a close friend, and was the, uh, at a time, was the leader of the Poor People's Campaign. He was actually with Martin Luther King the night before he was assassinated. And, and Dr. Lafayette, also, a lot of times, will share the story of how they talked about institutionalizing and internationalizing nonviolence. That was the next move. Um, I've been blessed to, to study under a lot of, a lot of really smart people and meet smart people along the way, 
of course, we're all cognizant of the uh, of the events unfolding in Afghanistan right now, uh, and and I, I I bring that up because in my first day of nonviolence training, out in so it was an institute in Rhode Island where people come from all over the world to study nonviolence. I we do this icebreaker. And so we got to pair up with people. I'm socially awkward, so I hate this stuff. And so I pair up with, with someone that, that just happens to be right across from me, and we make eye contact. And her name is Azra Jafari, who was the first female mayor in Afghanistan. Uh, Hamid Karzai was getting a lot of pressure to... Uh, to, to, to put women in positions of power, and so he put her in this position that was impossible. And so, so here I am, I'm like, oh, I'm from Eau Claire. I <laughs> and she's like, well, let me tell you my story. <laughs> um, and she's, 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 and I, I, I'm thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of Azra because she was, she was learning nonviolence to implement it in Kabul. Um, and I, I met other people from Liberia and Nigeria and, and all over the world. Um, and so I've been really blessed and eventually I became a certified Kingian nonviolence trainer which led to, uh, I became a fellow of not, Peace Studies and Nonviolence Fellow in Wisconsin where I would go around to college campuses all over our state and I would lead and facilitate nonviolence trainings for students and faculty, help implement peace studies programs. Um, and, and so uh, that has led to, to a, a lot of experiences, that has led to a lot of trainings, and I feel like, like I learn I learn a lot every time we get together like this to talk about nonviolence. Um, I'm committed, and to be honest, I'm a convert because I didn't always believe in the power of nonviolence. Um, and I, I'm so, so I consider myself a convert, and I'm 100% I'm in now. So I'm looking forward to uh, to, to being with you uh, tonight and tomorrow. And, and feel free at, at any point, if you wanna talk about any of the experiences I've had or any of the experiences you've had, uh, feel free. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to tonight and tomorrow. Thanks. I have a, quite a task um, ahead of me to follow up such renowned practitioners of nonviolence training. Um, actually, Salika brought me into this, um, into this workshop um, through work that we had done together um, in Conversations of Colors, and I talk a little bit about that. So, so my name is Rod Jones. I am uh, an assistant professor at UWC. I work within the Department of Special Education and Inclusive Practices. I'm also a recent appointee to the Eau Claire City Council. Um, some of you may have seen me uh, as I vied for that position, but um, just recently installed there. So some of the work that, that I um, have been engaged in since I've been here in Eau Claire, which I moved here in 2009, 19, I'm sorry, from Florida, is the work that Salika and I have done through Conversations in Colors. Some of you may have seen that. But in that program, we really kind of unpack some of the complexities of issues as they relate to race, you know, sexuality, gender, you know, inclusivity uh, in a, on a broader scale. And so I think I may have, I don't know, maybe impressed her a little bit, and she thought it might be good for me to, to be a part of this, right? Um, but I consider myself to be an inclusive pedagogue. Excuse me, wow. I consider myself to be an inclusive pedagogue. Uh, and I say that because 
in my nearly 20 years of working in, in K-12 in Florida, my work was done within the auspices of working with students with disabilities. And I learned a great deal about inclusion, working with students with disabilities and their families. Um, you may not think that there's a lot to be learned about violence and, in, and, and inclusion when working with students with disability, that there's a lot. Because there's that historical system of oppression and marginalization that people with disabilities have had to face and continue to deal with, right? And oftentimes, I had to advocate and fight for those students and families in a way that other students did not demand that, that, that need, right? Even for families. And so I had to be strategic about using the system against the system, right? Because I had insider status. And so I had to educate students, families on how to actually deal with the system to achieve the outcomes that they desired, right? Um, and sometimes that got me into a lot of trouble with my colleagues, <laughs> right? Um, but it was all in the name of, you know, just trying to help families. You know, and I, and I felt as if, if I could do that, right, and do that with a sense of integrity, then I was okay. I was okay, right? And so my work with you all will be through, through that lens, right? How do we work together, right, in a very inclusive way to kind of unpack some of these systems, right, that, that allow us to perpetuate these structures or ways of thinking about how do we deal with violence? Now, violence, you know, in a physical sense within school systems, right? You would see kids fight, right? You would see kids fight. But a lot of the violence that I dealt with was epistemic violence. So kids being miseducated, right, on the basis of their disabilities. Epistemic violence. So that's a different way of engaging in violence, right? And so I hope that that lens that I bring uh, through conversations that we have, right, that I can talk about some of the, maybe the physical characteristics, but more so some of the more nuanced philosophical characteristics. Um, and so that's kind of where I'll be adding my, my touches in the conversations that we have with you all tonight and tomorrow night as well, okay? Uh, look forward to, to learning from you all as well. Thank you. Okay, index card one, two words or less, what is your purpose or goal in big letters? Because you're going to be flashing this and standing with it. Purpose or goal for being here? So purpose or goal, that's going to be index card number one. Two words or less. I'll give you three. I'll give you three. You know, an elevator speech is only supposed to be five words when I'm going begging money for groups. I have five words or less. When I'm trying to talk somebody into not shooting at people, I have five words or less. So three. And on the second one, Who is your target audience? What are trigger words for defensiveness or opposition from that target audience? And what topic do you want to talk to them about? So the first thing is who is your target audience on this one? That's number one. Your second is what would be trigger words? for that target audience that causes them to push back against you. And the third is, what is the topic? So you're gonna turn that last card in with the three parts to it. Um, you might be trying to work with kids or teenagers who are resistant. You might be trying to talk to ordinary people who you know have race issues. You might be trying to talk to people who you know have gender sexuality issues. You might want to talk across religion in certain ways, but you want one thing to focus on. 
Does that make sense? Because we can't do everything all at once. We think we can. That's the problem of being human, because we, we kind of have this meat package in our head with electricity running through it, and it makes us think we can do things that aren't always intelligent. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, your purpose, your reason for wanting to be here? Yes. OK. All right, so your purpose, reasons for wanting to be here, holding opposites. Okay, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So stepping in, how do you intervene, right? How do you become an effective intercessor, right, in situations that may demand, right, immediate response? How to do that effectively, efficaciously, okay? Let me give you some talk time. Right, right. So, so and I think, huh, I, I, I've been there. And, and I've, it's been a journey for me. I questioned, I questioned the efficacy, even at times I think the morality of nonviolence in certain situations. Um, and, and so that's a, a, that, that, that was a journey for me. And I think I, that's a legitimate thing that we can take out of this is why nonviolence? Is, is there an alternative? What would that look like? And so I've, I, uh, I, I particularly appreciate that because I was right there. You know, the irony is I've got a book coming out next November, November 2022, on the Deacons for Defense and Justice. And while their marches were nonviolent, they were an armed self-defense group. So one of the things I can talk about is how nonviolence intersects with these other groups. So where is it going to be effective and where you're going to have to deploy other types of tactics? So we'll, we'll talk about that. And how we can, right, and how we can resolve conflicts in a way that's constructive and not destructive. Right, right. Because, because I, look, conflict is part of being a social being. We're gonna engage in conflict. I tell people all the time, look, I'm a big peacenik. I'm the biggest peacenik I know. I engage in conflict all the time. I got, I got two kids. We engage in conflict. I've, I've been married 27 years. I love, love, love my wife. We have a great relationship. We have conflict. Conflict isn't the problem. It's how we respond to conflict that seems to be the problem. Uh, and, and so to, to, to help work through a lot of that thing, I think is, is really important. Sure, so organizing, in a way, look, most of the time, those of us that are trying to change the status quo, we don't have the resources that the people that are protecting the status quo have. What we do have is each other. We have, so nonviolence is sometimes referred to as people power, right? And, and so it's, it's how to organize that in a way to make it the most effective way. I don't know if you've ever gone, you, so the protest or some direct action has been scheduled and you go there and there's four people, that's intimidating. That's, that's one thing. If you go there and there's, there's 80 people or there's 800 people, that's easy. And, and it's easy to join that. But, so, so it's how to organize uh, events, how to organize people and, and how to get people how to get the most out of the people that are willing to, to share in your struggle. You know, a lot of times, a lot, because there used to be, we hear this all the time, and maybe Salika will talk about this, we, there, there used to be always strong, we, we'd say strong leaders, right? Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Gandhi. We, so there were people that were like, really strong leaders, we knew that they were the leaders of movements. And now, oftentimes, like Black Lives Matter or, or other organizations, other movements, have been referred to as leaderless movements, right? Um, and this, this, this isn't anything unique from, from, uh, from our experience. This has happened all over the world. The truth is, people don't, a lot of people don't like it that it's referred to as leaderless movements. 
I, and I was, I was sharing with these guys, I've had the opportunity, so I travel with students and, I, and I, I've taken them down to Ferguson, Missouri for some years. And until, until the last time, we had uh, Corey Bush, who would spend the whole day with us, with my class, talking about the activism that occurred in Ferguson after, after a young man was shot um, and killed out in the street. And, and so it, she takes very, very big exception to the idea that it's leaderless movements, and she refers to them as leaderful movements. And it's really, it's, it's not only being able to organize people, but being able to find out, to get them to embrace their role in a movement and capture that energy. The, oops, sorry, the majority of the movement were local leaders. And just like Black Lives Matter today, there's a website, and the local leaders are kind of like, yeah, whatever. They don't give us money. They don't show up here. They're not the ones doing the work. The majority of the people doing the work, I'll talk a little bit about Father Gropi in uh, Milwaukee, um, are people like us here. And that's where some relational networking and strategy, and way, there are ways to bring us together. Now that we have social media, there's actually some easier ways to bring us together. And my group, United Bridges, has actually used social media in some really unique ways, especially with last summer's marches, but also to mobilize people to get water to people in need, to get food to people in need, so we've been building the networks within the communities. And that's the unsung part of the civil rights movement that you're beginning to see a lot of. What was happening on that local level? Who was doing the work? And this is the unsexy part, but it's the part that's important because it's the part we do. Tonight is about what, why are we here? Why, why would we engage in nonviolence to, to begin with? Um, the, the, the first and most obvious point is it's more effective than violence. We need to be, as I said before, we need to be more strategic, we need to be more organized, and we need to be more forceful than the people that are trying to protect the status quo if we want change. It turns out that nonviolence is a more effective way than engaging in violence. This isn't, this isn't an opinion. That's your opinion, man. That's, that's actually, that's been proven empirically uh, by people like Erica Chenoweth wrote a, a famous book about why nonviolence, why civil resistance works, it's called. Um, which, which she was also a skeptic of nonviolence. And uh, her, her colleagues challenged her to prove it. And as she engaged in research, she found that throughout history, nonviolent movements were more effective at bringing about change than violence was. A lot of people think, well, look, we, you know, the civil rights movement, they did nonviolence, and look where we are now, we didn't make enough progress. Well, that's not that's not because they engaged in nonviolence, it's because we haven't used nonviolence enough. Um, that's really our goal, is to make nonviolence mainstream. Nonviolence also makes clear to everybody who has the moral high ground. Because, and, and as we've seen with, with demonstrations, with protests, with movements, there will be provocateurs, there will be people, there will be hooligans, there will be people, and, and of course, that's what the media loves. And the people that are committed to nonviolence, that are committed to creating change through nonviolent strategies, oftentimes aren't the people you see interviewed on the evening news. Both Gandhi and Martin Luther King 
believe that the means and the ends cannot be separated. That violent means will bring about violent ends. And so it's through nonviolence that we bring about a nonviolent end. And reconciliation, civil society, is really what we're after. Nonviolence, when we talk about nonviolence, a lot of people think they automatically jump to protest, demonstration, direct action. And certainly that's a, that, that is a part of nonviolence, but nonviolence is a philosophical framework for social change. Um, the practitioners of nonviolence understand not just, look, going to a demonstration and carrying a sign with a clever saying on it can be empowering. Going to a demonstration and being, and being a part of that, of that demonstration can be empowering for you. It can be empowering, it's empowering for me. But understand that that's for you and that's for me. Demonstrations don't bring about change. That happens after the demonstrations. That happens through hard, hard, arduous work. Um, so, so we need to put it kind of in context. What direct, direct action actually, the context of it? In that what Martin Luther King taught is that part of, part of social change is negotiation. But what happens oftentimes is that we're negotiating with people where there's a huge power differential. If, if I go in, so I work on a college campus, if I go into the chancellor's office and try to negotiate something, well, there's a power differential. And so we're not negotiating on even terms. And what Martin Luther King taught is that direct action is part of that negotiation. That, so, so I go to a, a power holders, decision makers, office, we try to negotiate, and they're not negotiating in good faith because they have more power than I do. So then I go get 500 of my friends, and we shut down a transportation network. Well, now we go back to the power holder, and now I can say, look, we actually, I have some power too. Let's negotiate in good faith. Direct action can mean education. But it's important to understand what the goal of direct action or protest or demonstrating is. Um, practitioners also understand that they need to keep their eye on the prize. And what that means is that too often we get distracted. Too often that in nonviolent movements, we pick certain people, certain politicians, certain whoever, and we say they're our problem. And the truth is, that distracts us from the real purpose of what we're doing. As an example, uh, I, I spent time at the Standing Rock uh, uh, camp in North Dakota to show solidarity with the water protectors. We had a a, a midnight uh, uh, march that we did, and we were, so it was led by uh, indigenous leaders, and so we got to a point where we were from here to the, to the back of the sanctuary, and there was a line of sheriffs um, and police that, uh, that, that were dressed like they were about to Storm Fallujah, and so they had they had they had rifles, they had halogen lights pointing at us, they had all these things. They were afraid of us, unarmed people that you know were at this camp trying to protect water, and uh, and 
we said a prayer as we stood across from them. We said a prayer for them. That they be well, that their families be well, that their children grow up with clean water. We did this all because they weren't our enemy. If you understand anything about the Standing Rock movement, it was about 500 years of colonization and conquest. It was about environmental racism. It wasn't about these people that are trying to make a livelihood and put, a, put food on their family's table. And so we have to understand as nonviolent practitioners that, that we have to understand what we're fighting against. And it's not people. It's systems of oppression, systems of injustice. And finally, I would say this, that, that nonviolence, nonviolence is uh, rooted in love. And rooted in love in the sense that rooted in love for the rest of humanity, that we are connected. Whether we like it or not, we are connected. We are in this together, baby. We, we are in this together. And I am never going to reach my full potential as a human being until you all have the opportunity to reach your full, full potential as human beings. And so when we talk about nonviolence, and we'll get into the details and the direct actions and, and how to operate those, the truth is, we have to also keep in mind the context in which we're operating. Some people see nonviolence as a religious philosophy. Other people see it as a secular philosophy. Um, I'm a military historian. I think in terms of strategy, tactic, actions, mission. For me, non Violence is practical, especially when I'm representing a group that's traditionally marginalized. Now, one of the reasons why I've been able to do that, though, is that I have, even though I came to Eau Claire in 93, I have deep roots now here. And that my children have gone through the school system. I have slum cookies with multiple people around here. I've told their, their kids have come through my kitchen and dirtied my floor. So I've built a little street cred. I have also taught my chancellor that, yes, I am crazy enough to do what you think I will. So there's a little bit of fear based in there too. Martin Luther King of Malcolm X, when Malcolm X wanted to come up on the dias during the March on Washington, um, you know, people like Reverend Beverly, they didn't want to let him up because Malcolm X criticized King very heavily. And what King said was, no, you let him come up because without him, we are not effective. We are the carrot. He is the stick. They can negotiate with us inside or they can deal with the angry people outside. So in some ways, we, we need that inside and outside, and nonviolence also operates within an understanding that some of us are going to have to infiltrate the system to be the people inside pushing for change. Does that make sense? So it doesn't just sit, it's not just a march. And what Director Phillips said is very, very important, a march illustrates a principle. But a march in and of itself isn't going to do anything. It is something that is just meant in some ways to be media management. Direct action is meant to move people. Now boycotts are slower. Pickets are a little faster. You know, if it's a store and you're picketing them, that actually discourages shoppers from going in. So they're going to look at their dailies and go, we've lost X amount of dollars. Uh, so you have pickets. You have uh, sit-ins. 
which means they cannot operate their business. It comes directly from the labor movement. You have registration drops, which are a direct threat. As you can see, because they want to shut them down so much, they are a direct threat to corrupted politicians. Uh, but the, the idea behind direct action is to make discrimination too expensive. So one of the things police reformers like me have done is we've talked to the insurance companies and we started pushing on budgets. You're spending this much on police. Why? Isn't that a waste of money? If they stop using these tactics, you can lower taxes. These tactics cost you. And to have insurance companies telling them, uh, y'all gonna have to stop some of these tactics or we're gonna raise your premium. If you're a self-insured city, that means you're gonna have to raise taxes or you have to raise bonds. Filling jails raises taxes. Every person in the jail costs them money. And every person in the jail means there's somebody who's a real criminal who is out on the prowl. Who would you rather have in jail, a nonviolent protester or the person who shot up a family? So it forces the community to make some hard choices. But nonviolence also discomfits the comfortable. It's very easy for people to ignore that people who look like me are being shot or having our rights violated in a segregated environment. Because the comfortable people are insulated from it, right? It's a lot harder if I'm sitting in at your lunch table. It's a lot harder if I'm blocking your road and making it harder for you to get to work. Yeah, you're angry and you're going to scream. And government and business will now have a motivation to either prevent that or to stop it. So this is why direct action is important. I never say that direct action is civil disobedience, because it isn't. You're not breaking an illegal law. You're not breaking a legal law. You break illegal laws. You break the laws that are unconstitutional already to force the local, state, and federal government to enforce rights. Does that make sense? And one form of direct action that every last one of you have the ability to do is this. This is a, there's video live streaming apps everywhere. If you don't have one on your phone yet, put it on. Because I will tell you, Minneapolis and Milwaukee police know the minute they see cameras, they calm the heck down. Now in Georgia, they tried to outlaw videotaping police. The Supreme Court just yesterday issued an injunction. You have the right to tape and video police as long as you're between 20 to 50 feet away. And that deters a lot of corruption and misbehavior. It deters a lot. But nonviolence also involves religious activists coming together with secular activists. This is going to be the hardest thing for our world. Because right now, how many times do you see religious and secular coming together? It's like we live in different bubbles, right? Yes. Secular people are not people who feel religiously motivated or pushed towards nonviolence. So they may or may not go to church. They may or may not be atheist. They may be agnostic. But they do not feel that nonviolence is a religious, Christian, Muslim, or Jewish imperative. Does that make sense? 
So to many people, even though I'm a practicing Catholic, I'm a secular activist. Because I'm not doing nonviolence because of my religion. I'm doing nonviolence because it's practical. So this is the person who, they see the inside of a church when they're dragged to a wedding. Does that make sense? Or they may believe in a creator. They may have a belief set, but they don't necessarily believe in a set of spiritual beliefs encoded in a book inside of a human institution. Someone who's religious can be a wicked because they have a religious imperative and a religious idea. That's their imperative for why they're there. Does this make sense? I, I just think it's not useful. I, I'm sorry to say that. Not, these two uh, uh, words and this structure is, is just not useful for me. I, I'm a Muslim. I don't know what secular is. I'm not necessarily motivated uh, to you know, work in nonviolence, to be an activist uh, because I'm a Muslim. And then who is he going to pit me against? Who are the secularists that are going to pit? See, I just, I'm, I'm not buying it. I'm sorry. <laughs> The reason why we say secular is because people who are atheist do not be lumped in with religious activists. And religious activists in the traditional movement who have tended to be Christian or Jewish are motivated by the Sermon on the Mount. And they feel that they are being Christian martyrs. Does that make sense? So there's a set of activists who feel very firmly that they're Christian act martyrs and that the only way to do it is there's one way to do it and it has to be nonviolence. People who do not have that feeling that they have to be martyrs will be more secular and will be more willing to mix nonviolence with armed self. Does this make better sense for you now? Because when we talk about black power versus the traditional civil rights movement, or today Black Lives Matter versus Moral Mondays and Reverend, um, I just lost his name, Reverend Barber down in Georgia. Reverend Barber is a religious activist and steeped in the idea that this is a religious imperative. Stacey Abrams is a secular activist. She's worried about power, she's worried about voting rights, but not because she thinks it creates a Christian utopia or a Jewish utopia. Because she thinks this will help these people we know. So that's why in, in history, this is the why we use this vision to describe these two sets of activists, because they worked together at one point in the movement, and then they separated into the Black Power movement and the traditional non-Black movement. And today you see that separation beginning to happen. So the question is, how do we prevent that separation? Does that make sense? That makes a little better sense now? So, we move from this to these ideas of class as well. Because we have a movement right now that is stratiated by class. Middle class people want to be nonviolent. Most working class people want to be nonviolent. Some working class people, some younger activists, believe in violence. And one of the things you're going to have to do is figure out how are you going to manage that. Last summer for the Jacob Blake as the United Bridges representative, I was running logistics, I had to work with some activists who really would have liked to have forced a violent confrontation. Given my druthers, that march would not have ended in the county courthouse because that's an area where people can open care. And indeed, that's what happened. I went over there and set up a medical tent, 
And my happy black tail found 30 armed gay, you know, 30 armed bikers out there. Now notice the people who wanted to set up that confrontation weren't the ones out there. And they would have been perfectly happy if I had gotten shot. That would have given them the kind of attention they wanted. They were incredibly angry that I escalated the situation, gave the bikers water, and by the end of the march, the bikers were mixing with my students. They took my students down to Water Street. I'm not sure the police were happy about that one. So I'm going to talk about how you manage those people and work with those people who may want violence. They want to work with you, but they're going to have a cross purpose. And how you identify that and how you protect yourself. We had a fairly elaborate training that went along with that march. You know, so I'm not the reason that march went off without any tickets and anybody getting in trouble. We had a core set of 35 volunteers who were organized in a slack, who were all armed with cam who were all armed with cameras and everything else on the face of the earth. And that is what kept 2,500 people safe. Four days after Kyle Rittenhouse had shot three people. So these are the things you have to think about. Does this make sense? The last thing I want to talk about very quickly is the idea of media management. The one problem BLM has had. All right, before them, Occupy thought that just having a march or just sitting in a park was going to get them what they wanted. And when older activists like John L. Lewis said, no, you need to organize, you need to build, capacity at the ground up, you need to work with the media, you need to do this, they're like, yeah, 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 get off the stage. And then they went into shock when the police arrested them. And they had no plan for after that. Some of the younger BLM activists also didn't have a plan for after the arrest. Didn't think about how to turn that into their favor while a number of the older civil rights activists who had lived through the first movement were the local ones you saw in Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, et cetera, they turned all of that stuff into voting rights and registration. They turned Georgia blue. They almost turned North Carolina blue. They got within a hair of Alabama. One of the things that they understand is the media can be your friend or your enemy. And when you talk about how do you get people to come out, you make friends with media. Are you raising your hand or are you stretching? Because I don't know whether you're doing it. You need to make friends with the media. You need to have people whose job it is to work with the media. But you also need to think about how you're talking to people. Remember the slogan, defund the police? Which didn't really mean defund the police. And that's problematic, isn't it? Many times we have this in language, and we understand the in language, but other people don't. When I'm in Los Angeles and I'm talking to people, I'm not going to say defund the police. I'm going to say end police corruption change police tactics, change police training. I'm going to be very, very specific. If I'm talking to a white farmer up here who thinks that BLM just blows stuff up, I'm going to say political corruption. I'm going to say neglected roads. I'm going to say, you know the politicians forget your needs too, right? because we have to learn to talk in ways that these other people can hear what we're saying. So that's one of the things we have to do today.
We have to talk in the ways that other people know what we're saying. So there's certain terms we're going to go over, and Director Phillips and I will go over them. One of them is this term direct action. And direct action are actions that put direct pain or pressure on a governmental or business entity. Does this make sense? Armed self-defense. Armed self-defense is legal self-defense away from a march. So an armed self-defense action would be protecting your house. An armed self-defense action is not taking a concealed carry gun to a march. Does that make sense? Organization. When I'm saying organization, I mean networking. And we're going to talk about deep canvassing and networking and bringing people to you. Scripts. By the time you leave tomorrow, you will have some scripts you can memorize to de-escalate problems and to try to break through defensiveness. Is this making sense? But you will build these scripts off of the prompts that I'm giving you because you'll remember them much more easily. And when we say scripts, I don't know if y'all ever read Dear Abby or Carolyn Hacks or the advice columnists. They always want to give you a paragraph to say to that person who's being obnoxious in your, in your life. You need to tell your husband who's acting up or your child who's acting up. Da, 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 da. I have a 14 year old and a 21, almost 22 year old. Can I get a paragraph out? Three to five words, right? Go clean your. Yes, Bob! I need you. No, I'm doing. So we have to talk about shortening the way you talk to some of these people who are defensive. So I see our fearless leader in the back, and he's supposed to be keeping us on time. Are we good on time right now? We, we are, Salika. We are so good? Yeah, we're good. Ooh, we're at 818? All right, so we've gone through sort of the first set of cards, right? I want to collect the second cards. So let's do all of the second cards are going to my pledge. Can you read me what the third card is that one of them and we'll talk after that? Okay, the third card. All right, the first one was your target audience. The second was your trigger words. And the third was your goals or why you were trying to talk to those people. Because we want to talk about pedagogy a little bit. I want to unpack the cards, but I want to go through the six principles of nonviolence first. Principle one for Martin Luther King is the idea that nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. And understand that nonviolence means somebody is going to not like you. You got to be prepared for that. I get all sorts of uh, emails and texts, and my filter is set on my email at work and home to take anything with the N-word out of it. So about once a week I take a look at those and send them to where they need to be. It takes courage to face injustice. It, it, it always will. To, to, it takes courage to stand up to try to change the status quo. When we think of nonviolence, the word itself, nonviolence, non means the absence of violence. There's a lot of different, different definitions of violence, but it's not just we don't even have our own word. <laughs> we, we, so nonviolence is active. It's an active force um, that, that changes things. 
The, the second principle is that the beloved community is the framework for the future. King talked about the beloved community as a community where relationships are elevated to the level of justice and love is used as a powerful social force to enhance those relationships and to change social conditions. We focus on the relationships um, there. The, he saw it not as a utopia. He saw it as a very practical, very achievable goal. Um, so he, that's, that's the beloved community. The, the third, in, in which I talked about a little bit, the third principle is attack forces of evil, not the persons doing the evil. We're not attacking people. We're attacking injustice. That's a really important, that, uh, and, and by the way, I've hung around activists my whole adult life. This generally is the hardest principle to abide by. It's easy to point at a governor or a president or a senator or a mayor and say they're our problem. But they're products of a system, and we need to attack systems, not people. We need to do that out of a sense of love. Out of a sense of love for people that, that have a veil of ignorance that needs to be lifted. The fourth principle is to accept suffering without retaliation for the sake of the cause to achieve a goal, accept suffering. Except su suffering can come in nonviolent movements, suffering can come in all kinds of forms. I don't know if you've ever sat through a school board meeting or, or you've stuffed envelopes for three hours straight or whatever. That is a certain level of, of uh, suffering. And it's important, I think it's really important to understand what kind of sacrifice you're willing to endure. Because when you're out on the street, when you're right in the middle of something, is not the time to decide, okay, I'm ready for this, I'm ready to go to jail. I'm ready to lose my job. I'm ready to be excommunicated from my family. You don't want to make those decisions on the fly. Look, I'll give you an example. When, in the run-up to the Iraq invasion, I had just, I had just started a job at UW Lacrosse. I mean, like, like, I had just started. And we were getting ready to invade a foreign country that I felt very strongly we should not so I organized a symposium to talk about the people, the politics, the geography of Iraq, hope, hoping the idea that people with this knowledge, they would be less likely to support killing them. And it turns out it was a sexy enough topic at the time where people were paying attention to what I was saying. And now I'm doing interviews on the radio and I'm doing interviews on TV. I'm in the newspaper, I, so all of a sudden people are, are listening to what I'm saying, and I knew that there would be sacrifices. I knew that there would be people that would be mad at me. I was called a traitor, I was called unpatriotic, I was, I, I was and, but I knew that. What I didn't know, and what I, could, what I should have foreseen but didn't, is that in my neighborhood, parents, wouldn't let their kids play with my kids because of a stand that I was taking ab about an issue. My kids were being socially isolated. We need to think deeply about the sacrifices we're willing to make. I was right. So 
But, but that's the, those are the things we need to think about beforehand. The fifth principle is to avoid internal violence of the spirit as well as external violence. What, what that means is that if we can't do it for ourselves, we certainly can't do it for our communities. We do violence for ourselves in all kinds of ways. We're not good enough, self-loathing, all the things that we do violence to ourselves. If we can't, if we can't stop doing violence to ourselves, we certainly aren't going to do it for our community. So that means taking care of ourselves. Look, this is intense. Doing nonviolence can be very draining. And I've known a lot of activists that were committed nonviolentists that were miserable, miserable people. Because they took on the world's problems, because they weren't taking care of themselves. And we're not going to be led down the path of peace by people that are angry, people that are jealous, people that are greedy. Um, we're going to be led down the path of peace by people that have inner peace. And so it's taking care of ourselves. Look, in the Civil Rights Movement, why do you think they sang so many songs? Because they needed to. They needed to uplift their spirits because what they were dealing with out of the streets would kill their spirit unless they took care of themselves. And it's the same thing now. The sixth principle is that the universe is on the side of justice. Now, when King talked about the universe being on the side of justice, certainly as a Baptist minister, he referred to, he, he was talking about God is on the side of justice. This also has other meanings. And the, the meaning that I get from it is that, yes, the universe is on the side of justice. If we invest in violence, we will get violence. If we invest in injustice, we will get injustice. If we invest in peace, we will get peace. We get what we deserve. And right now, in our culture, and in many other cultures, we're not investing in peace. And we need to. The, those are the six principles of nonviolence as King taught them. These are, by the way, if you're interested in reading more about them, his first book called Stride Towards Freedom, which was mostly about the uh, bus boycott. One of the chapters in there is called Pilgrimage, which, which describes King's pilgrimage to nonviolence. And he addresses each one of these principles in that, in that chapter, if you're interested. Thank you, Joe. Um, so it's your turn to talk. Um, you guys have been sitting here quite patiently and very astutely. And so I want to spend a little bit of time unpacking this third uh, card with you guys um, and just reflecting on some of the things that you have to share at this point. Um, I think it's gonna be instrumental for all of us. So the third point was, and I could be wrong, Salika, remind me what the third point was again. It was the, the goal, the goals that you guys have from this. Um, this training, and again, you know, we want to make sure that we are listening to you. It's not necessarily about us. You know, we bring a certain set of experiences and knowledges to this. But we also want to make sure that we're listening to you and we, we're speaking to your heart as well. Okay, and so whoever wants to share out first, um, what goal or what mission or what do you expect to gain from this or desire to gain from this as you move forward? I know some people have already maybe tangentially mentioned that. Um, I think you were kind of more direct when you talked about your uncle at the family reunion, right? Um, and there was another piece that you said too, I can't remember, but I remember the uncle piece because that stood out to me. I was like, oh yeah, I remember. <laughs> right? And so I anyone else? Yeah. yeah. 
Yes. She has a decade of experience at going to peace protests and marching, and I've raised her as an advocate for equality and equity. But there's often a social disparity for the people she's up against, especially being a young woman of color when she has to deal with an old white guy or a Karen, and she needs to talk to them and stand up for her beliefs as she moves from homeschooling into public school. This is a big concern for me, also as being the small demographic of a Muslim in this community. So as we go through the progress tonight, many of us are already empowered as adults, and we're used to standing up for ourselves. But what tools can we give to youth in particular? How can we help my shrinking daughter um, also be able to stand up to people she's going to meet as she ventures away from her mother? Well, I kind of feel like I should just Thank introduce you. her to my 14-year-old. They can have a conversation. But we do, one of the things that we are going to teach tomorrow is the, the staying calm and staying in your frontal lobes. I don't know how many people in here have had impli implicit bias training. If you've had implicit bias training, raise your hand. Have one, two. Yep. Implicit. Implicit, implicit bias training. So people will usually tell you what implicit bias is, but they don't tell you how to stay calm. They don't tell you how to stay in your frontal lobes. If you've ever had an arc, oh, okay, I use the Uncle Jojo, you know, the, 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 the uncle at Thanksgiving, who you go in and you say, I'm not gonna fight with Uncle Jojo. I'm not, I really, I'm not gonna fight with your Uncle Jojo. And then you get there and Uncle Jojo starts pushing buttons and all of your good intentions go out the window, and at the end of the night, you have upended the mashed potatoes on the Uncle JoJo's head. So there's a couple of reasons why, and I can give you some interventions, uh, which I have to say, I was at a family wedding last weekend in Los Angeles, and I used every last one of them. Uh, these are all field tested, trust me. And the, the idea of complementary osmosis, that's the, the condescending tone that people will use with someone younger or somebody that they're contemptuous of, that contemptuous tone. Disrupting that tone, disrupting the, 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 the ways that, we are here in Wisconsin, you know, Minnesota nice, Wisconsin nice, it's sort of passive aggressive. You're wearing that? You look nice today? Oh, so nice to see you today. You know, and it all has these implications. So there's some ways to disrupt that. And especially for young people, they'll be very effective. Now, I will warn you though, as a parent, you don't always want them being aimed back at you. I, I told my daughter, uh, you know, I'm a Catholic, I went to Catholic schools. We had the test where you have to kneel on the ground and your skirt has to hit the ground. And I threatened to do it to her over a skirt. She said, Mom, you're body shaming me. <laughs> so I'm gonna teach your kid this, but that means that if you pull any of this, because some of these are parental tricks that we have done that maybe we shouldn't have. You know, th those people may not be the only target. So you have to think about whether you really want me to teach that to her. You sure? All right. So there's interventions for that kind of thing. Especially, we'll talk about square breathing. We're going to talk about um, four, seven, eight breath. And we'll talk about staying within your frontal lobes and um, in your, out of your somatic nervous system. If you've ever talked to someone, you see their eyes glaze over. I work with college students, I see this all the time. So where have you been the last five weeks? I don't know. So why did you smoke that? I don't know. So why did you try to jump off the roof of my house with the bungee cord? I don't know. They're, they're, they, they are not in their And when we see people start to repeat 
themselves and seem like they're robots, that's because they're in that, um, they're in their limbic system, they're in the brainstem. They're no longer thinking. So we need to be able to recognize that and move them out. Does that make sense? Now, now for the shrinking teenager, this is also effective for parents. So, so you may not want me to teach your mother this one. Just letting you know. <laughs> no, I was going to ask. No, thank you, uh, Salika. So for, for the rest of you, uh, I know some people, again, there were a few of you I remember from the beginning of our conversation. You kind of shared, you know, what was the overarching goal that you expected to gain from this, right? And so let me, let us hear from others, like, what is it that you would like to walk away with at the conclusion of this, this, uh, this workshop? Some goal or goal that you have. I had the experience in June and again here the 1st of July to be involved in some direct action for the first time in my 68 plus years. <laughs> And it was very, very interesting. And uh, both were extremely well organized with really, everybody was, had their ducks in the row and it was just really good. But what I, uh, you know, and thought about in advance in both of those, where do you want to be? You know, are you absolutely don't want to be arrested? Well, if you do, okay, or yes, I do. And so really had to think about those things in advance, which I had not had to ever do before. And um, so it was a very interesting experience, and even though I was in the green group, meaning I did not want to get arrested, but if I did, I guess I would handle it, but I was driving, I still found myself feeling uh, at times just this, well, what if this happens, and what if that happens? And I thought, you know, we're just supposed to do our job. Do my job, do my job, I'm on the road, I'm waiting for people, it was an all-day deal. Um, but there was still that little fear. And so I guess, you know, and I think that's normal, However, it was very disconcerting for me, and it made me think about um, people who really do have to be concerned about fear, you know, in their lives, in their whole lives, you know, and, um, but also, how do, how do we continue to do these kinds of action and be able to manage, uh, to do it with courage, without feeling like fear is uh, stopping or, um, Paralyzing, yeah, and it didn't, but it was really a very interesting introspective experience, so I'd like to hear a little more about that. Yeah, and I have a comment I would like to make, but I also would like to hear your observation, too, Jim, because normally, right, we, we have a desire, a penchant to operate within this system of equilibrium, right? Balance, stasis. Right? And so when something goes off kilter, whether it's you know, taking direct action or whatever it may be, that disequilibrium right, can be very disconcerting, as you mentioned. And so one of the things that I think that Salika is going to very expertly, and Jim as well, talk about, and I talk about, I used to do this work with my students, right? They help them use different techniques in addressing you know, authority figures. right? How do you address authority figures effectively? to get what you want, right, without, right, completely disrupting the system, right, in a way that is, that is oppositional to your interests, right? I used to work with students to do this. So I think one of the first things you do is recognize that fear is normal. I used to teach my students that. I teach adults that. Fear is normal. It is a normal part of existence. Right? Now, how we resp respond to it, that's where it gets messy. Right? That's where it gets messy. And so I think in terms of specificity, I would like to hear from you, Jim, in terms of how have you and, and people that you've worked with right, in these direct action types of set setups or arrangements, right? how did you guys work through that? Sure. I, you know, I, I would just say that we say the first principle of nonviolence. Nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. So first of all, what we've all had to muster courage at times. 
right? So what were the techniques we used when we mustered courage? What, so when you've been in a position, anybody, when you've been in a position where you've needed to muster courage, what were your strategies? What would you do? What? Pray. Breathe and even focus on your breathing, right? Because we know that when our breathing changes, a lot of times it means that our mind is not in equilibrium, right? So even understanding, focusing on our breathing and, oh, my breathing is heavy right now, right? Just even acknowledging that and recognizing that and observing that can help. What are other strategies? Fear comes from cortisol. Feel, fear comes from cortisol moving from your brainstem into your brain. So one of the things you can do to limit fear, and this comes from stereotype threat, and the teachings about stereotype threat, uh, is to write three to four affirmations, to chant those affirmations. If you're going to go and argue, say, with the boss, rehearse but you're not rehearsing long speeches. You're rehearsing, this is, the, this is what the boss will say. This is how I count. This is what they will say. This is how I count. You know, we're going to talk about assumptions, and we'll talk about assumptions, and we'll talk about countering those assumptions as one way to handle fear. But that's where the scripts come in to start building some comfort. So I'll shut up and let y'all say some others and answer Jim's question. Yeah. The other thing I would say is that, and, and as, as Saliga and Rod have said, fear is healthy. <laughs> um, we need to, to understand, we need to understand the stakes. We need to understand, right? So, so okay, so let's say you've never been to jail before. How intimidating would it be to get processed into jail, right? It would be really, really intimidating. And so, so to, to understand that, I mean, that's a healthy fear. So role playing, right? If, you know, that's kind of what I would do with students, right? So it involves rehearsing, right? You know, playing, we use the term devil's advocate, but you guys are comfortable, right? So a student would say something to me, I would respond in kind or in different to, right? And so these are the things that we do to help us kind of mitigate some of the unknowns, help us mitigate some of the unknowns. And so I don't want to say much more because I want to hear from other people about your goal or what do you like to gain from this? I know we've had a couple of people already. Uh, one of the things that uh, frustrates me the most and is most intimidating is coming up against people that do not want to listen, refuse to listen, have their mind made up, and uh, approach with anger and convoluted arguments and uh, efforts to get uh, into a debate. And uh, so I would like to find uh, ways to get through those kinds of barriers so that uh, we can make a personal connection, that maybe can, that maybe can uh, move us forward in uh, a more peaceful way and less contentious way so that we can actually hear each other. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> and I, to be honest with you, I think you guys may have something totally different, but I, I think there must be a recognition that not everybody is going to get to that place first, right? But also, too, I think sometimes practicing distance and space and time and allowing you know, that de-escalation to occur, sometimes people can't be spoken to in that moment. They just can't. They are too aroused, right? And sometimes you just have to back away and give them distance and space in time, and then come back like, right? Because sometimes the more you talk in that situation, the more help they're gonna get. If they're just gonna reach you, right? And so a lot of times when I work with people like that, I just have to back away in space and time. 
and hopefully broach that later with them, right? If they're in a better place. One thing you can do is, the reason why I had you write trigger words on the cards, is to start being aware of which words will trigger people to move from their frontal lobes right into the vestibule. Ooh, I can't even pronounce it today. <laughs> you know? Because for some people, especially if they are in a fear-based frame already, certain words will trigger them to shut down. Um, privilege is a word that some people have been programmed immediately to shut down and go into defensiveness. Um, I'm trying to think of another one. They, they, they do this with systemic racism. So there's just certain words that you know they're stopped listening. So what we have to do here tomorrow is we're going to develop some new vocabulary to be able to get through to them. Does that make sense? Because when I see people having a cow about systemic racism, if I push the word corruption, this is political corruption. It's political corruption, it's aimed at this group here, and it's aimed at class here, it's a, they get that. But they have been victims of disinformation. And some of, I went to Chatham House in 2018 and I got to sit with a number of the agents from MI5 and MA6. And we were talking about disinformation even then, early. And Chatham House rules is you don't say who it was exactly, but Tony Blair was in the room, or a lot of people in the room. And one of the things that we were talking about and that the, the people who had been doing brain scans of people who had been fed disinformation is if you avoid the words that they have been conditioned to stop listening on and you use the why questions there instead, you know, I hear you say, so they'll say, those mm, are taking my jobs. I hear you saying you're afraid of job, you're losing your job, why? Restate it away. Or you're afraid of corruption, why? What are you seeing? I moved one relative who was a black nationalist this weekend who had gone on a rant, it doesn't take much to set them off. And pushed him away from the, we blacks have to just all be together, can't trust, uh, 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 to, oh, well, maybe that does make sense. By reframing what he was saying, but staying away from his trigger words. And recognizing his trigger words are meant to trigger me. So I have to know what words trigger me to stop listening to. Does that make sense? And I'm gonna to have to breathe through those words so that I can reframe the argument. And this is hard. I'm not gonna say it's easy. But I've had to sit in rooms with people who absolutely believe I am a subspecies and move them to my position. I have to sit in rooms with politicians who don't want to listen to me and move them to my position. So I have to find the ways to pull them to the shared values and away from the perceptions they have that somehow I'm the enemy. So start, you know, tonight, I really want you to start thinking about this idea of reframing. Does that make sense? And think of these conversations where there are trigger words. You know their trigger words. Think of what your trigger words are. 
it's interesting that you say that, Selika, because I'm thinking about your uncle. And you, I mean, if you think about it, really, the family is probably preconditioned. If your uncle such and such says this, if he says that one word, all of us do, right? We, we, we kind of do, right? Did you know the next course of conversation might be? I'm straight to something. But for the most part, right? And I know I have it. Because when they say something, it's like, okay, I don't know what we hear now. We hear all kinds of women. But I think that's a very public point that you raised. Uh, so maybe you can hear that one. Just, just, just briefly. There's, there's this idea of, that's called interest convergence, which, which just basically means that if, if you, you understand what they're interested in, what their goals are, and you can frame it in a way, well, you know, you will get what you want if I get what I want, and a lot of times, I mean, it just comes down to negotiation. And that, and so when when we talked about the civil rights movement, there was interest convergence in that our government didn't come to any moral epiphany that said, "Oh, we should just start treating black people better." They came to they came to a conclusion that it was hurting our standing internationally, that we were going to lose the Cold War because everybody saw the we didn't have the moral high ground anymore. So it's, it's looking at that. And then finally, I would say, look, we all have limited capacity and limited energy. There's people that we're not going to move the needle. And so, so there's a lot of people that we can. I don't, you know, I get a lot of people that come up to me and say, what, what should I tell my racist uncle at Thanksgiving? You know what, don't engage with your racist uncle because, because if they're overtly racist, there's a lot of what we consider racism skeptics that are people that are more ambivalent towards racial injustice than opposed to racial justice. Those are our people. That's what we need. And so there's, there's different ways to navigate it. Absolutely.